but he's a professor in the Regulatory Institutions Network at the Australian National University. He holds a chair in intellectual property at Queen Mary University of London and is a member of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. He's written a lot of seminal works, which I'm sure many of us have had occasion to refer to many times in the past. Thank you very much, Professor. Thanks very much uh, for that introduction. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the, uh, the open air community for um, really uh, granting me such a smooth passage to Cape Town. It takes a lot of hands to arrange all of these things and I've really uh, enjoyed the last couple of days. Um, Given uh, today's or this morning's uh, performances and indeed the afternoon performances, uh, these are in fact the very hard acts to, to follow. I, I had thought of uh, doing a bit of singing and dancing myself, uh, <laughs> but uh, this would be to inflict an unnatural form of punishment, <laughs> probably in breach of various human rights conventions <laughs> against torture. So. Um, <laughs> I've decided just to just to speak, uh, really be incredibly conservative, not even move uh, from this microphone. Um, when uh, Jeremy asked me to respond uh, in a way to uh, the scenario project, I, I was really thrilled because the kind of sweeping analysis that he's presented um, is work that I think as uh, scholars and as academics uh, and indeed as part of the activist community, we should all aspire to, to really think big, as it were, about the future. And, and in a way, that's what I see this uh, project as doing. So uh, let me, uh, what I've tried to do is to uh, pick out a few issues. Now, um, I'm not going to be talking that much about intellectual property, I will use it for the purposes of illustration, but my main concern is to try and pick out some of the themes which I think are both either explicit or implicit uh, in, the, in, the, in the scenario's work. Uh, where are we? Hang on. Oh. Well, that's it. The scenarios are finished, as am I. <laughs> I can't seem to... Uh, is there, uh, that one? Oh, that one. There we go. OK. So, we're back on track. Um, I really want to talk about three very different areas which I think uh, illustrate um, the themes. The first one is energy. Um, this is mentioned uh, in the scenario's work, and I do think it's very um, fundamental uh, for all countries, uh, but especially for uh, many countries in Africa. Um, it's very hard to run uh, an economy uh, without a reliable energy supply, and there is now a parallel discussion taking place in the world community um, led by a number of organisations um, which are really focusing on access to energy issues and the kinds of poverty that go along with um, situations of where people don't have access to reliable energy. And the International Energy Agency has some very frightening statistics about the consequences, for example, especially for women and young children of cooking uh, using biomass, so cooking over wood uh, stoves and so on, and the effect of particulates upon health. Um, energy poverty, in fact, according to the International Energy Agency, is actually killing more people than many of the diseases which people in the Access uh, to Medicines campaign fight. Uh, so importantly on. So here are some projections uh, for 2030 by the International Energy Agency concerning the number of people without access to electricity. Really the only key point to note here is that it's really the African continent that by 2030 will still be 
according to these projections, um, in a situation of where something like 42% of the population will not really have access to electricity. Now, in a sense, this is an opportunity and it's not a situation that we can't change. I mean, my assumption is that the future hasn't happened yet. Um, by that I mean that the choices we make now um, will decide what the future is. It isn't determinate, as it were. And so there are pathways that would enable us to avoid this particular uh, scenario coming true. But I think it is a scenario, and it goes to the infrastructure and technology driver that um, this open air team have identified as really a critical issue for many, many countries um, in Africa and particularly countries uh, in the sub-Saharan uh, part of Africa. Let me now say a few brief words about... Um, so so the, 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 the energy scenario, I think, is an invitation to think big. Um, it seems to me that there are opportunities. Uh, as someone remarked uh, in one of the sessions or one of the uh, groups that I was in, Sub-Saharan Africa does have a lot of sunlight and the cost of photovoltaics is coming down. There are potentially huge energy export uh, possibilities there. So, um, and there is a lot of money around uh, for renewable energy. So there are interesting large-scale entrepreneurial possibilities and um, that they're the sorts of possibilities we have to think about if we're going to get off the kind of path that the International Energy Agency is predicting. Let me now say a few words about finance. Um, this goes to the question of the representativeness of uh, developing countries in international uh, financial architecture. Um, as you're all aware, we've gone through a period uh, around about 2007, 2008 and 2009 that is described as the global financial crisis, but actually is a crisis that emanates in the United States and spreads then to other parts of the world. Uh, there have been a number of reforms, and I don't have uh, time to go into them in detail, but one has to ask how significant have these reforms actually been, and especially have they really benefited developing countries? So I'll just use one example of this. The International Monetary Fund um, is uh, an organisation in which countries get to vote. In essence, if you're a political scientist, you would see the IMF as a vote-buying game. Um, after the reforms of uh, what are called the voice and quota reforms to the IMF, um, which have now come into operation, um, the United States still holds 16% of the votes and under various supra-majority rules in the IMF, 85% and 85% majority is required. In other words, the United States is still in a position to veto. Now, if we go to the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, which are collectively regarded as the front runners um, in this global economy, and um, four of those countries are now in, in the top ten uh, countries in the world economy. Those countries collectively do not have more than 14% under the current IMF voting structure. So one has to ask how is it that half of the world's top ten countries on a GDP ranking do not have enough power um, to block an IMF proposal that they do not like. Now this does speak to the representativeness of these global institutions. What I think it means for countries in Africa is, and this is a theme that I think is both, uh, was, uh, is implicit in the scenarios project and really was made explicit in the very interesting group discussions we had this morning and this afternoon,
is that there is a case for strategic disengagement on occasions. So as a country, one should think about strategic disengagement from institutions that may ultimately be delivering very little benefit. Speaking extremely crudely, it seems to me that the reforms have not really freed us from what I call Ponzi capitalism. The kind of speculative, um, unproductive activity that we see Wall Street engaging in has not really been curbed. And I think we face a very large moral hazard problem. This does have implications for developing countries. And in particular, I think it's important that developing countries begin to think about the principle of strategic disengagement and how it might apply to financial architecture. Now, some countries are already doing this. I think it's significant, for example, that the BRIC countries are talking about establishing a multilateral bank. Now, this is probably going to cause a lot of people in the IMF's corridors to laugh or smirk, because after all, they're so powerful and so important. So the idea that they could have a rival seems ridiculous. But if one doesn't begin to think big and one doesn't begin to think about other institutions and how these other institutions might serve one's people, then you will be trapped by hegemony. That is extremely clear. Now, there have been previous attempts by countries to break free um, of this financial architecture, most notably during the uh, East Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, in which Japan proposed the establishment of an East Asian monetary fund. Now, unfortunately, that idea was crushed. Um, Nevertheless, it seems to me that the BRIC countries are on the right track and South Africa has a voice. So South Africa can think uh, on behalf of many African countries about how this principle of strategic disengagement should uh, play out. Let me now try and bring finance and intellectual property rights together a little bit. One of the things that's not talked about very much is the role of intellectual property rights in taxation, or more specifically, tax evasion. So this is a quote from J.P. Morgan uh, in a report they published um, last year. Now, what the report says is that multinationals are essentially centralising many of their valuable assets, intellectual property assets, in low-tax jurisdictions. The reality is, this is a quote from the report, that IP rights are easily transferred from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and they are often inherently difficult to value. And I might add, very easy to get. So the usual response of taxation authorities to transfer pricing is to apply an OECD rule, um, which is arm's length pricing. That, that, that doesn't work very well in the case of intellectual property assets because these things are actually quite difficult to value. All tax jurisdictions, all tax authorities around the world are struggling with the scale of this problem. It's actually not spoken about, but it's costing states trillions of dollars. I'll just give you two quick examples. Microsoft used a transfer pricing game to shift half of its $42 billion or $21 billion research budget uh, to Puerto Rico, and it saved itself $4.5 billion in US taxes. So in other words, this is a problem that affects the United States just as it affects other countries. Oddly enough, this is a case where the United States is a loser in intellectual property. And in the Irish transfer pricing game, it's a very small office in Dublin and I worked out that each employee in Dublin in that particular year made $11 million. It's a great example of labour productivity. <laughs> So this raises a very important question, I think, and it's a question that I think the scenarios raise for us as well. It is, how can we create institutions that think? Uh, 
that think and respond to many different kinds of problems. It's not so much a question of creating policies because policies change as the context changes and we don't know whether a policy we pick today will in fact be a winner for us tomorrow. If you have a look at what Indonesia has done on energy, for example, it sold off a lot of its energy assets and it's about to become an energy importer. So its policies on energy look pretty bad, look pretty bad. And so Indonesia is a model of, for a resource rich country, probably of what not to do. So what you actually need then are institutions that can respond to dramatic changes. And so I'm going to suggest that part of the answer lies in responsive regulation. At the heart of responsive regulation is an ideal. And the ideal is that institutions should respond, or regulators rather, should respond to pressures from below. They should learn from pressures from below. They should learn from social institutions. So this is a very different view of regulation. It's a very different view of law. It's not about the state commanding things through law. Rather, it's about institutions responding to pressures from below, regarding pressures from below as opportunities for learning. That's really the key behind the responsive ideal. Now this responsive ideal has been taken by my colleague John Braithwaite who has spent many decades um, along with many other people working on a theory of responsive regulation. And at the heart of responsive regulation is the enforcement pyramid. How can institutions obtain compliance? How can they learn from pressures from below? Now what you see before you is what's called the enforcement pyramid. The key point about the enforcement pyramid is that it tries to encourage regulators not to think about punishment as the first option in a regulatory response. It's rather a sequence of possible responses. And according to the enforcement pyramid, according to the responsiveness of I. Uh, the ideal of responsiveness, one should always engage in dialogue. One should always begin with trying to persuade people to comply, or one should always listen to why they're not complying. Now the pyramid um, presents a certain sequence to regulators that they should work through. You always begin at the bottom of the pyramid and work your way up to warnings, to civil penalties, criminal penalties and ultimately incapacitation. The important point here is that there are many different kinds of actors in the world. There are virtuous actors, there are calculating actors and there are incompetent or irrational actors. And so each part of the pyramid is designed to deal with different types of actors. And you work from the bottom to the top. you never begin with criminal responses or incapacitation. Now, let me present you with an, a map of how you might use this to develop what I call a responsive institutionalism. This is a rather complicated scheme and I'll just spend the rest of my time talking about it. Um, and I'm dealing here with the problem that I outlined earlier, the problem of transfer pricing and how does uh, a state respond to the problem of transfer pricing. How does one respond to large corporations using complex licensing and assignment agreements to shift profit around so that they avoid paying taxes? Well, the first point to make is that no regulator can solve this problem on its own. A tax office does not understand patents. And a patent office does not understand tax. And um, another regulator, for example, a regulator of pharmaceuticals, may have something to contribute to this conversation. Um, it may be a missing 
an important part of solving these particular problems. Because remember, what pharmaceutical companies try to do is to convince states that they should pay the maximum amount for patented drugs. That's what a GlaxoSmithKline does. And at the same time as it's persuading governments that they should pay a high price for patented medicines, those same companies are using the patent system to shift profits around so that the government doesn't even get the tax benefit of the very high prices. This is a deeply, deeply iniquitous situation and states have to address it. The only way in which states can respond, and indeed any weak set of actors can, responds, can respond to this situation, is through networks. The prescription for any weak individual actor is to network with other actors. It's impossible to deal with complexity, the task of managing complexity in our world in isolation from other regulators, from other actors. Now, ideally, one would have a patent office that conceived of its role in a very different way to the way in which patent offices do now. Patent offices should not think of themselves as being in the business of granting patents. That is not the job of a patent office, any more than it is the job of a central bank to continue to print money. No central bank in the world is chartered with the task of printing money. It's chartered with the task of bringing financial stability to a system. And if you want to see what happens when a central bank abandons its mandate, you just need to look at the case of Germany between the First World War and the Second World War to understand what hyperinflation does to an economy. So, we, so in just the same way that central banks don't think about increasing the money supply as their main task, patent officers should not think about the granting of patents as their main job. Rather, they should think of themselves as intervening in a system in a way that increases the welfare effects of that system for people. Patent officers are chartered by us, society, to give us a better future in terms of technological innovation. They should be looking after, being caretakers or custodians in part, not solely, of the innovation system. That is their mandate. That's what we charter them to do. If a patent office grants twice the number of patents it did last year, there's something very wrong with that patent office. It's not looking after the innovation system. So in my ideal world, the Patent Office would understand what its true purpose was and it would look at its enforcement pyramid. It would begin to look at companies that were on the information from the Tax Office registering a disproportionate number of patents that were being registered or licensed to entities in Ireland or in the Cayman Islands or some other place. So in other words, the Patent Office and the Tax Office would have a dialogue. The Tax Office would learn from the Patent Office about um, the effects of some of these particular patents. It would gain some overall picture from the Patent Office about what kinds of technologies were being assigned. And the Patent Office would be able, using its enforcement pyramid, to target particular companies, to call them in. In the beginning, this would be a friendly conversation. We notice that an awful lot of your patents are ending up somewhere else. And indeed, um, another response by a Patent Office to this, uh, as part of its enforcement pyramid, might be to form a special audit team that would begin to assess very carefully those patent applications that were being filed by Google and Microsoft and GlaxoSmithKline or any of the other multinationals that are in this particular tax evasion game. <coughs> 
the patent office and the regulator would learn from the regulator of, say, the pharmaceutical regulator about the prices that these companies, if we're dealing with pharmaceutical companies, are charging the government. And through this network, through this network, we would gain some overall understanding of what these companies were doing. What we would try to be doing would be to coordinate a response amongst a number of regulatory institutions. Each regulator would be able to bring its own particular enforcement pyramid to this particular task. The tax office um, would bring its powers, considerable powers, um, which ultimately may well end in criminal enforcement procedures. Together, this form of responsive institutionalism of institutions that think about a problem would help us to solve a problem that affects many, many different kinds of states. I'm looking for a time signal here. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I've sketched, um, I've sketched an ideal, uh, obviously. Unfortunately, many patent officers misconceive their task um, in the world today. And tax officers are overwhelmed, particularly in developing countries, by capacity issues. But it doesn't mean um, that the game is over. If we begin to think big, and that's one of my most important messages really, and it, it's a message I think that the scenarios really invite us to think about. If we begin to think big and try and envisage a world in which our institutions better serve us, then we have some chance of arriving in such a world. We can make these choices. A tax office in a developing country can learn from an, OECD, from an OECD country as to how to tackle this problem. It can enrol uh, the advice of a JP Morgan or a Deloitte's. Um, there are many possible networks that can help developing countries to achieve greater capacity. And if we don't begin building those networks, then there's very little chance that will create institutions that think and deliver us to the better future that we, all, that we all want. We don't want to arrive in a world sketched by the International Energy Agency or the International Panel on Climate Change. We don't want to arrive in these four degree worlds, worlds in which ecological systems are collapsing. So, the message, I, or the three things that I really take away from the scenarios project um, is one, to think big. Secondly, to think about strategic disengagement from the world system, because there may be occasions on which you have to do that. And finally, um, to think about how institutions can better serve you, because the future is open. That's the critical point here. Okay, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>